Hello, this is Mark Baer. You are watching the Joe Cupcake Chronicles. Today, we are in episode five, part one. Sisyphus Rocks, the discreet charm of bourgeois Joe. First, Sisyphus. As every artist knows, you never get the rock up the hill. You roll the rock up and it rolls back down. You never reach your goal and there's always somebody with a bigger rock that's running faster and rolling higher, but this is the job of the artist. This is the artist's lot. And poor Joe Cupcake, one day, he can't get up. He can't get out of bed. He can't roll his rock. But that rock is love. We have to roll the rock. We have to go up the hill. The discreet charm of bourgeois Joe is directly uh, related to the discreet charm of the bourgeoisie by the great Louis Buñuel, Spanish director, surrealist, and absurdist, I would say. Joe Cupcake is a man who embraces the absurd. He revels in the absurd. He is, in a word, truly absurd. Part five is a bit of a summing up. This has been a long journey, and what Joe has discovered although he's been trying to change, although he's been trying to be better, is that he is who he is and he really isn't going to change much. But he has learned a few things. And in the end, Joe, as always, gives thanks. Thank you for everything. I have no complaints whatsoever. Um, baby, um. <laughs>
wanted to dive, wanted to jitterbug, wanted to jive, wanted to trust the universe, feel the love, raise his rate of vibration, discover his highest purpose, be cheerful, animated, keyed to the highest pitch, wanted to do good, do well, do right. Joe aspired to be a ripe cheese, mature and mellow, a gorgonzola, a fine stilton, but feared he was only old and moldy. Not everyone noticed he hoped. He tried to keep up appearances, but maintenance was lax, systems failed, gears jammed, rot set in, apathy abounded, and like a carnival cruise ship, at any minute, Joe could stall out at sea. Unfortunately, at this stage of his life, Joe was very attached to his defects. He had a fondness for the morally ambiguous and could ferret out charm where others experienced disgust and outrage. He had a distinct want of circumspection, adored a little devilry, and believed if the last shall be first, it was best to be fashionably late. He loved his dog, loved his wife, loved his kid, loved his friends, loved his country, loved the world, and was eternally grateful for all his blessings. Conclusion. Joe was who he was, and he wasn't going to change much. But he did know a few things. He knew that every day is a gift, and to treat each new day with the proper respect. It could all disappear, snap, never assume, be mindful. Life, untidy, disorganized, muddled, jumbled, chaotic, fleeting, fascinating, and unbearably beautiful. He knew things that endure are comprised of the simplest of elements, but it takes a lifetime to filter through all the non-essentials. He knew the world was awash with amazing people, accomplishing amazing things, changing the planet in big ways and small, and one must not despair in the face of overwhelming odds. He knew a single individual could change the world and benefit all humanity. He knew the value of a light touch and minty breath. He knew, like Miles Davis, to never play it straight. He knew, like Oscar Wilde, that some senses, no less than the soul, have their spiritual mysteries to reveal. He knew to be cut off from any part of one's life, even the seemiest, most embarrassing, most reprehensible, most petty, is not to be fully alive. He knew in the mundane, the drab, the dull, the routine, the monotonous, chopping onions, peeling potatoes, to look for the magic there. The sheer poetry of everyday existence is awesome. He knew a fish wasn't in the boat until it was on ice in the freezer. He knew something had it or it didn't and was fond of saying, it's the little pop that makes all the difference. He knew everybody could be a pain in the ass. The wise could be idiots, gurus could be grumpy, and sages could get suckered in pyramid schemes. He knew to be happy, one must have a center. There is no security, wealth can vanish, friends can disappear, and health can turn. Treat each day as a sacrament. Bliss comes in snatches. Take it when it comes. We are replaceable, we are insignificant. It is best not to believe one's own press clippings. He believed vitality was all, life piled upon life, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Schopenhauer believed no absolute, no reason, no God, no spirit at work in the world, nothing but brute, instinctive will to live. Joe believed in the brute, instinctive will to create. It was all about showing up, putting in the time, and giving expression to the primal forces that push imagination, lightning and thunder and the passing rain. What Joe didn't know was who would play Joe in the movie version. Joe met with the producer and painted a panoramic vision spanning five continents, several centuries, employed a cast of thousands, and required the audience to wear 3D glasses producer saw it scaled differently. Imagine my dinner with Andre, but without Andre. The story would be simple. A tale of our times, 
The powers that be turned a deaf ear to the populace. The humble downtrodden pleaded, Noblesse oblige, stop squeezing us, please. And they grew noisier, and they grew stronger, until there was a roar, and at the end of the day, there was hope. Joe would play Joe, all Joes, many roles. Every man, or at least one in a dozen, bursting with prejudice, vanity, imbecility, insecurity, hypocrisy, and fears. Public humiliation, police interrogation, E. coli at the taco doodle, online crooks writing malicious code, a massacre at the mall, pelvic mesh, mesothelioma, hemorrhoidal burn. Some Joes were luckier than other Joes. Some were sharper, some stranger, some simpatico, some twits. Joe, the leading man, would be tip-top, all a hunky, modern art, a cross between Motherwell and Gottlieb, and a soupçon of Jackson Pollock's totem lesson number three. He'd say things like, you're so beautiful, pal, you should go to Lover's Lane alone. Or, the only way I could be any happier is if I were a twin. His leading lady was a sophisticated dish, a blue plate special with cherry pie dessert, a tasty combination of piano, bass, and drums. Dance with me, come dance with me. Oh yeah, kiss me, darling. Kiss me again like it's the end. Do bop, do bop. Under a sultry, melting Velveeta sky, moving in opposite directions, they smack head on. He, a reckless rebel, now a society pillar. She, a society pillar, now a reckless rebel. Meanwhile, out in the barricades, Neo Dada anarchists design a laser knife to cut the federal building in half, but with a practical side, so later they could use it to carve a roast. Oh yeah, this was cinema. The marriage of the film image to the poetic image, scandalous, subversive, where no idea or image might lend itself to a rational explanation, and all doors to the irrational were open. It was about the shock of the new, take that zap, take that pow. It was about reflection, refraction, hoochie coochie and smoochie smoochie. It was about Matisse color, explosive color, color as dynamite, kabang, fireworks, yellow, gold, plum, orange, kaboom, crazy whack color like the pulsating red in Van Gogh's cafe. As they march, they shout, art will smack you down. Art will drag you up. Art will spit in your soup. Art will wipe your chin. Art will drop your drawers. Art will cloak your soul. Art will divulge your crimes. Art will heal your sins. Art is a dagger, a razor-edged benediction. Art will frighten you. Art will subvert you. Art is mind-altering. Art in the wrong hands is... Joe! He heard again. Joe! There was tapping on the bubble glass. Sound fuzzed in and out. The peanut, the little brain, had fallen asleep on his tuffet. The windshield was foggy and caked with bug paste. Joe worked the wipers slowly, he focused. Oh man, he was at the office, in a meeting. Joe, ideas Joe. What now? What did they want now? It all came back. He had to find a company spokesman. There was a gecko, a baby day trader, William Shatner, Shaq. They needed a mascot with a high cute factor to take the public mind off of tar sludge, media tyranny, obscene bonuses, and Chinese sweatshops. They needed a movie star, but no movie star would work for World Corp. Not even the most ethically challenged. Not on the budget Joe was given, but his supervisors assured him if anyone could do it, he was the guy who could pull a rabbit out of his hat although they didn't say hat. At the office, Joe was making it up as he went along, straight-faced, inscrutable, an inkblot test. He'd been wrestled subtle by the gymnastics of the elite upper-floor shark management. Those deities on high, a hundred floors and above, angels of the corporate lord. Said Hemingway, that is what we are supposed to do when we are at our best, make it all up, but make it up truly. Sometimes, it was tough sledding for Joe. Sometimes he was slogging through quicksand. Sometimes he resembled a poem by Stevie Smith. 
I was much too far out all my life, and not waving, but drowning. Up on the top floors, they bowed to the big boss, even when he wasn't there. His shadow alone was a scrotum tightener. His name was whispered in tense, hushed tones, Goldenrod. Pander, lie, distort. Keep the shareholder sedated. That was the mantra in Valhalla, and Joe suspected his associates were also navigating by the seat of their trousers, despite the puffed and bloated show of confidence. The truth twisters, the message massagers, the minister of sinister, the minister of propaganda, the minister of euphemism, man, woman, in between, didn't matter. This high up, they were all unbearable bullies who thought two balls and a dick etched in charcoal was the only art to hang on a wall, and Joe, so to speak, was hanging with them. His mind wandered, bits and pieces of a poem by Philip Larkin, to fall apart amongst the flowers, what we should never have known, sidestepping, fluttering, quick flecking, dropping like tops under blue sky, skipping white under the sultry pall of green summer. It was warm and moist inside the bubble. The peanut was nodding again, had probably stayed up late consuming porn, and as Joe retreated deeper inside and his fellow workers seemed farther away, he was thinking, all the girls are shaved down there now. He was nostalgic for Bush, gave the burning bush a whole new meaning. His thoughts drifted off to those naked men walking the streets in San Francisco he saw in the news. Did they have jobs? How would that work out? He thought of Goldenrod, CEO and overlord, up there in the penthouse suite, reading Transcend, Nine Steps to Living Well Forever. Goldenrod could go naked all day, put in some six-inch white plush carpet, the tip of his rod painted gold, his furry chest shaved to display the company logo, a globe pierced by a screw. Hmm, Shazam. He had an idea. This could be big, a new product line. The Executive Miracle Manscaper Blade for masculine grooming, or for the ladies, the Eager Beaver. World Corp, clipping the planet clean. Hmm, maybe toss in some hair dye. Joe pictured God with flowing white hair and enormous white beard admitting he might trim the beard and take out some gray. If God were made in our image, wouldn't he be susceptible to advertising? A good smear of vitality brown to the temples would be tough to resist. And then Joe was thinking he needed a snappy theme song, identified with only him, like Johnny Carson or Tony Bennett. I left my clothes in San Francisco. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Or, a horse is a horse, of course, of course, unless the horse is a talking horse. Oh my God, was he singing out loud? No. He heard again the semi-permeable membrane that was the bubble. Joe, what are you thinking? What he was thinking was, a sensitive soul can only look so deep. What he said was, Archie Leach. Cary Grant. Cool. They liked it. Dead. True. But Charlie Chaplin and IBM had a nice dance in the 80s. Joe pitched the campaign. Only the suave survive. Alchemy woke Ho's predatory ways into a happy romantic romp. Good. Back slaps, high fives. He heard the peanut working levers pulling pulleys. He was safe to slip back to the cineplex. A film was forming. Art House European, Albert Camus, the myth of Sisyphus. The gods condemn Sisyphus to ceaselessly roll a rock to the top of a mountain, whence the stone would fall back of its own weight. The gods had thought that there is no more dreadful punishment than futile and hopeless labor. But one must imagine Sisyphus happy, declares Camus. The struggle itself towards the heights is enough to fill a man's heart. Joe heard tap, 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 like the drip, drip, drip of the raindrops when the summer shower is through. And there was his co-star, lips a quiver, tap, tap, each tone a heartquake. 
and kisses circled the room, illuminating a swath of cool blue over an ambiguous green. Tap, tap, louder, damn, this wasn't a kiss. What? It was his assistant, Marshmallow. Well, the assistant explained that dead Cary Grant's live agent laughed in his face. Uh, what about Johnny Weissmiller? How much swinging could he be doing these days? More than Joe supposed. So, no, Tarzan, no Jane. Dead was out. What comes after dead? Stuffed. Okay, he said, let's try for Cheetah. A chimp might work. World Corp, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. And back to the bubble. Next, Cary Grant, go with Jerry Lewis. The French love him. Well, not nutty Jerry. His agent was also a prick. So, for a lot less, we got Barry. Buñuel directs. The stars were sugar sprinkles, and Joe vowed he would sparkle too. He, a mere cupcake in a pantry of croissants. Joe looks into camera, channels bargain Barry, crosses his eyes, emotes, if the world were clear, art would not exist. The disembodied voice of Buñuel answers, if you were to ask me if I'd ever had the bad luck to miss my daily cocktail, I'd have to say, that I doubt it. Where certain things are concerned, I plan ahead. For Joe and every Joe, the battle was the same. The distance between the idea and the action, between the seed and the plant, between knowing better and doing better, that distance is great. Please recall the hollow moon, the barrier wall. Music and dance on one side and on the other side, Joe. He desperately wanted to get to that place his heart desired, but could not find a door, a window, a ladder to climb, a pole to hurl himself over, or a wire to strut across. He knocked, no one answered. Were they ignoring him intentionally? Did he really belong? So many questions, so much self-reproof, so many doubts. Was he deserving? Was he good enough? Desperate, depressed, confused. He was resolute, damn it. Joe, always a sucker for poisonous glamour, lethal lure, a pretty face and stiletto heels, was meant to be in some subterranean Manhattan dive with the shabby genteel at 4 a.m. surrounded by his pirate gang and supermodels where he would dodge flash bulbs vying to splash him on page six in his slippers and his monkey head pajamas. But nothing, crickets. Frustrated, angry, single-minded, Joe ran headlong into the wall an act of futility to symbolize his dedication. He did not crush his skull, but he was enveloped and had to pry himself out, leaving an impression so clean and deep he could be manufactured in plastic. The intaglio concavity wiggled, shook, slowly molded back to normal, and Joe, to his amazement, realized the wall was a mass of jiggling jello. Hmm, not bad and he proceeded to tunnel his way through, one sticky spoonful at a time. Lemon, orange, raspberry, black cherry, strawberry, apricot, grape, tutti frutti, and he heard bop bop loo bop a wop bamboo. A hand slithered out. Little Richard? No, no little Richard. Joe found himself in a rundown set of an abandoned B-movie lot. Not what he was expecting. No violin, no piano, no sax. Only a lunatic screaming, free poetry of poems, free poets from pencils. He was shown to his shack where he was told his rent was due on the dot by the fifth day of the month or there would be consequences. Joe was warned not to roam the halls after midnight. The floor got bumpy. It bent, swayed, had ups and downs, twisted, turned like rolling on a roll of dimes. Ezra Pound, Joe heard a vendor call. A pound a pound, on sale, only slightly radioactive. The age demands an image for its accelerated grimace. A lady asks, in a station of the metro? The apparition of these faces in the crowd? Petals on a wet black bow? Third door down, the vendor answers and barks. Get your nuts, get your nuts. 
bug nuts, bug nuts. I got lascivious, I got Leviticus, that's right. Like a dog to its vomit, a fool returns to his folly. And in the ghost's gray mist, Joe made out the ghost of poetry, flagging down a limousine, looking for a peep show. What's your name, darling? Poems for naughty lovers, a spot, a tick, a twink, a time, all it takes, two whoops and a holler, and only five dollar. Or better yet, is you is, or is you ain't my baby? Is my baby still my baby true? A cab stopped. The driver handed Joe a note and sped off. Joe caught a glance at the woman with the Medigliani face in the back seat through the hazy twilight. The note read, We all bear some blame. I'm sorry. I love you. Please forgive me. Joe turned the paper over. To whom it may concern. And off in the distance, on the edge of town, he saw a miracle of luminosity, five new dancing figures pulsing red, set against green earth and blue sky. The dance was primitive, rhythmical. It conjured insurrection and pleasure, and Joe knew at last he was home. The dance begged for music. Joe found discarded tubing in a junk heap outside his garret, a twisted assortment of pipes used for drainage issues. Some round, some hexagonal, some rectangular, copper, brass, aluminum. But the tubing sang to him, seemed to know his name. He coupled and cobbled the contraption together with wire and duct tape and drilled holes for his fingers and twisted a waterlogged reed into one end. Joe blew in the mouthpiece and elicited a gurgle, a groan, a curse, a prayer. With a wrench, he struck the metal. Bang, 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 bang. Shame on U.S. Shame on us. He could express himself perfectly. He made other sounds. He wouldn't call it music, but it was an awakening. Joe spent all his time making the noise swoop, dive, shout, and whisper. Joe was soon a solid sharpie, a bluebird blues man, a rockin' canary, a swell nightingale, a mojo oriole, chirping the sound that soared above the other songbirds. His neighbors didn't complain, but rumors got back to Joe, misgivings about the noise, about him. But Joe never doubted the value, didn't care. Not a rat's tail, not a cat's paw. Joe dragged the instrument into the street to serenade his fellows. There was a long line. The line wound around the block. A laid-off teacher, a vet, a doper, a family of Joes, Mr. and Mrs. and little cupcakes trying to maintain dignity. Joe meant the music to say, one Joe for all, all Joes for one. Someone gave him a buck to stop. Then a cop wrote him a ticket. Wallace Stevens, Charles Baudelaire, Bertel Brecht, gather to me. Touch my finger with your finger. I'm here, man. Joe, Joe Cupcake. Most esteemed dudes, touch my finger.